just to give you a bit of a background on uh, Paul's, he studied at the Ecole Normale Supérieure with the PhD thesis on football in Turin between 1930 and 1960, the centennial book uh, from 2000 to 2004, uh, and also as a lecturer in history in uh, Besançon, and uh, Stéphane Van Loek is the, spok the spokesperson of the Belgian national team for the men, the, the men and the women's side. Sport journalist at Gazeta Sportu, you know, is the biggest sports newspaper in Romania. And uh, yes, I wrote uh, a few things about, uh, about uh, um, let's say, um, the Romanian national team in that period. And um, the Conte Verde is, uh, let's say, a well-known uh, story uh, in Romania. Uh, and uh, we have also a journalist in Romania who's, uh, who, who died, uh, I think, 20 years ago. His name was Ioan Kirila, and he wrote a book. Uh, it, uh, it's named uh, We Also Went on Conte Verde. Uh, so the Conte Verde is uh, in the, the name of the book, and uh, yeah. it tells the story of the, of the trip. So uh, uh, the man who organized everything was uh, a lawyer. His name was Octav Lukide. So this guy, Octav Lukide, organized everything because it was very hard for a team uh, from Romania to go to Uruguay. So it was his idea to take the, the train to Genoa and to, to take the boat from Genoa with other European teams uh, to, to Uruguay. Uh, the king of Romania from that time, Carol II, uh, uh, select, selected the, a few players because um, one of the best uh, players of that decade, he was uh, Stefan Dobai. Uh, the players were amateurs, you know, and uh, a lot of them were working, you know, and uh, some of the bosses, their bosses didn't uh, allow them to, to go to in Uruguay because uh, it was, uh, you know, because they had the pause of two, two, two months from work. So uh, the biggest problem was uh, for a guy, named Emerick Vogel. Uh, he was uh, an ethnic German from the Western Romania. And uh, 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 Lukide and the other uh, guys who organized the team went, uh, went to his boss and um, uh, with big pressures, he was allowed to go uh, to, to Uruguay. Uh, so uh, finally, they went to, to Genoa and uh, we have a lot of interesting stories from Conte Verde because uh, they they had uh, the trip was uh, very long. Uh, I think two weeks or something like that. Two weeks, and uh, uh, the most interesting story is with a guy named named uh, Ladislaw Rafinski. Uh, he was in from Timisoara in the western part of the the country. He then also played for Rapid, who was uh, a, a very good team uh, in that years. Uh, okay. Very well-known team from yeah. Romania, Rapid. And uh, <clears throat> the guys were training on the boat, and Rafinski uh, took a very hard shot on the ball, and the ball went straight in the ocean. <laughs> and Rafinski, who was a good swimmer, he wanted to go after the ball. And yeah. Uh, yeah. And his uh, his colleagues uh, told him, "You are you're a moron. This is the ocean, not Bega. Bega is the river which flows through the Mishwara. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So this is the ocean. This is not Bega. his name was Rudy Vetzer, Rudy Vetzer, and uh, they took him uh, photo shootings. Let's say a day in a, a day of uh, the Romanian captain." Yes, and okay. they also took, took him photos in the bed or, uh, let's say, uh, washing his hands and some <laughs> all things like that. Yes, so it was, um, it was the first time for a Romanian footballer to be treated like a star. He was treated wow. like a world star. Yeah. He's the captain of Romania. And uh, they, uh, they were writing that uh, Romania was the first team uh, from Europe uh, that accepted to, to take part in this, uh, in this World Cup. The trip from the Mediterranean and, and Europe. So the Comte Verde had first picked up uh, the Romanian team 
I believe on the 20th or 21st, and they made their way to Villefranche-sur-Mer. And that's where they, uh, they picked up Jules Rimet and the, uh, the French team, as well as the, the coveted uh, statue uh, that was worth an estimated 50,000 uh, francs and um, made of solid gold and was transported in a, a customized uh, suitcase that was well hidden away from prying eyes. Um, what I wanted to do is I wanted to get your point of view, Paul, on the composition of the team that was uh, selected to come, how far or, or how close to the World Cup uh, was the team uh, selected? Did they have trials? Uh, because it was very late that they decided to commit to heading to the World Cup, as many of the teams uh, from Europe. So I look forward to hearing your perspective on the, the composition. Uh, thank you. Uh, first of all, Jules Rimet, the French uh, president uh, of the French FA had, and of the FIFA, had uh, huge difficulties to convince the French officials to let the national team go uh, to Montevideo. So uh, the composition was uh, the one of the one of the best team possible of uh, uh, French players. Since, uh, for for instance, you had the French goalkeeper Alex Tepo, who was certainly the best at the moment. Uh, some uh, young and and very good uh, back like uh, Etienne Matler, who made a very uh, good career during the, uh, the 13, or Ale Alexandre Villaplane, the, the captain. So it was a good, uh, good team, uh, which was difficult to uh, uh, settle because some of them had some uh, uh, kind of job. Uh, it was a time of sham amateurism in France. So they need to have a, a job. So some of them, uh, uh, there was one who worked for uh, the custom. So the, the French chef had to convince uh, the custom administration to let him go. One was a young uh, guy who was doing his uh, uh, military service. So uh, it was, they, they called the uh, uh, French, uh, 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 diplomacy, and so he was considered as a kind of a special envoyé to uh, Montevideo. So it was difficult. So they, they didn't have a real training before going to uh, to Montevideo. So they considered that they, they, they should train as they, they could on the, the Conte Verde uh, during two weeks, and then uh, at the arrival in Montevideo. So it was more and in the French press just before the, the, the departure, it was explained as not as a sport, uh, really sport uh, uh, journey. It was more a diplomatic journey. Uh, the more important, and it's stressed in many uh, papers, the more, the more important was to send a team and not the result. Finally, so uh, it was the first victory, and that's what the uh, French, uh, the Uruguayan ambassador, at a dinner just before the departure to Villefranche sur Mer, he, he said that the French had uh, uh, scored the first goal, uh, not because of the value of the team, but because the team was going uh, to Montevideo. And so we talk about the players who, uh, the French players who made the journey, but what about some of the players who didn't because of problems with, between this famous amateurism and professionalism? As I understand, uh, the brother of Lucien Laurent, mm -hmm. uh, I believe it was Jean Laurent, he did, he did not go he, yes, he, as because, a player. Yeah. Yes, because it was a time in which there was a huge debate uh, within the French AFA. Uh, between the, the official who was for the professionalism and it was pushed by the uh, creation of FC Sochaux, the team of Peugeot, and 
uh, the official who want to uh, remain uh, uh, amateur. And uh, uh, so if you go to uh, for two or four, at least three or four weeks, it means that uh, you, you need to be reimbursed and you need to, uh, to leave. So you, you are not uh, quite uh, uh, an amateur. And in fact, it was a debate that came from the debate on the uh, Olympic Games and uh, uh, the problem between FIFA and uh, uh, C uh, IOC. So, uh, so, so the team was kind of compromised and compromised made uh, by Jules Rimet, who was a, a very good negotiator and uh, a good uh, diplomat within his federation and within the, the FIFA. Right. We had, uh, if I can interfere, we had the same problem in Belgium with Raymond Brenne, the, the brother of Pierre Brenne, who did go to Montevideo. Raymond Brenne could be considered as one of the best Belgian players ever. He was, in fact, the Eden Hazard of the 1930s. Mm. And he was suspended by the Belgian FA mm. because he owned a pub. And because due to owning a pub and uh, gaining money from that, because of he's very known as a, fa as a football player, the Belgian FA said, no, then indirectly, you, you win money, you gain money by your football status, although it is by, by opening a pub. So he was suspended, moved to Czechoslovakia, to Sparta Prague. And so Belgium, in fact, shot himself in the foot by not selecting or by suspending Raymond Brenne. And maybe with Raymond Brenne in the team, we could have or should have done much better than the Belgian team did in Montevideo. If I can add something about the spirit of the team, uh, when they took the train to, uh, from Paris to Villefranche, the, uh, during the, the day before the, the departure on the Ponte Verde, the official lost the players, a part of the players, because the players went to the beach to have a bath. And uh, uh, it shows the spirit of the, of the journey. It was more for this uh, guy who maybe have had never traveled uh, outside uh, Europe. It was uh, for them first uh, a kind of big uh, journey of tourism, of uh, discovery, and more uh, in a way uh, some uh, uh, vacations, paid vacations, yeah. than uh, uh, right. participation to a world tournament. We didn't lose any players on the way with the trains from Paris to Barcelona, but we did lose our luggage. So uh, when they had to change trains in Paris, they didn't see the luggage and they were searching and searching. And then uh, one guy who was the, the co, uh, let's say, uh, um, president, he said, OK, I will uh, stay here and take care of the left luggage. And then when the train moved, uh, left uh, the, the train station, then on the other platform is so 54 uh, bags waiting. So they were not on the train. Then he took uh, several trains. Uh, uh, several stop trains before reaching Barcelona. I think it was uh, two days on the way and it was uh, very hot and every station where they stopped he had to move all the luggage himself and even at uh, the port in Barcelona when he arrived there was some trouble with, with luggages. So uh, yeah, that was really a, a calvary, let's say. So um, we didn't lose any players on the way to Barcelona but we did lose and we got it back afterwards the luggage. It's, it's, it's a sign of how travelings were organised those days. Now, on the contrary, the, there were different levels. And from what I've understood, the, in terms of training, periods of training, there was always a lottery. Uh, uh, every day there was a lottery of who was going to be able to, to train at what moment. And uh, I think that's... Um, it's very interesting to see that there was uh, there was enough space for them to to really do jogging, calisthenics, you know, gymnastics. I mean, that was a very big part of the philosophy, um, you know, of just the idea of sport and physical activity in you know from the late 1890s and through the 10s and 20s and culminating with the, the 30s. Uh, kicking a ball on the deck would be dangerous because every ball over the deck was a lost ball. 
was the lottery to to dedicate to decide on the training uh, hours was it daily or was it just once and then it remained because i what i read and heard and wrote also is that the belgian sites have been drawn to to train at 6 a.m so and i think they always had to train at 6 a.m so because they yeah. always had training at 6 a.m and they were served their breakfast the last and that on one on one occasion it it made the the coach so angry that he uh, pulled his table uh, and he had to wait because he had to wait that long and he or he, there are two versions or he smashed on the table and all the coffee was spoiled or when he when he saw another plate with omelets passing by where he, he thought it was the belgian side so or, or he pulled over the table being so angry and then he had been called into the captain's office and he had to apologize for his behavior so but from then on the belgians received their breakfast on time back to the to the point of uh, gymnastics I, I think it was not so difficult for the players because they, they were born in a body culture in which gymnastics right. was essential uh, they came for for the the French case it came from a rather popular or middle class uh, uh, background and uh, so they came to the in general to the French school the primary school in which there was no sport it was mainly gymnastics and so uh, I think they came back to this uh, uh, body culture of the, their youth so it was not so difficult to so uh, exotic for them In ter okay training is one thing but one thing that i realized during the u.s trip is that there were cliques and clans you know groups small groups that that would form because in all of the collections that i've been able to discover three major uh, photo uh, photo album collections. There, there's inherently a a clan, and you always see these three or four players together, you know, and and, and that was actually one of the the, the problems, uh, because you know my grandfather being the youngest on the team at, at 21 years old, he. Uh, he was he was the Benjamin, you know, the the the, the young one, mm -hmm. and so he kind of he was he could be quite shy, so he would keep to himself, and so he was rare in photo groups, you know, because a lot of them were 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 much, you know mid twenties, uh, at the very most uh, beginning of their thirties. You see, so so I find those clicks. Uh, to have been, and maybe those cliques were formed because of the fact that they uh, they played together on the same team. It comes along with, with the results, but in those days, I can imagine the people arriving in a completely new world, far away from home, after a two weeks trip on a boat, homesick, uh, seasick, landsick, whatever you, you can call it. It must have been dreadful for some of them. So, uh, and then also, then it's it's uh, you need to be a good psychologist to. To, to keep your team together and, and preparing them yeah, to, to, to perform. The Romanian team arrived on the Conte Verde in Villefranche. They, mm -hmm. are, they suffered already from uh, uh, sea sickness from Genoa to Villefranche. Mm -hmm. So the, the rest of the, the journey uh, had to be a, a bit difficult for them. Yeah. Many players suffer not only from sea sickness, but also land sickness. That means that after being for two weeks on a boat, on the ocean, you arrive in land, and your your brain is not um, in in the right combination with your muscles. So mm. it gives you well, they say it's giving you a very uh, dreadful uh, feeling, and that is called land illness in uh, well in Flemish. So they suffered from land illness. They suffered from <coughs> because the food on the Conte Verde was far too good and too uh, uh, too plenty. It was too many, too much to eat. And they did have three. Uh, they, they did have three meals a day, and and meals means, uh, yeah. yeah. Teams would dedicate uh, the time, um, you know, the desire 
to to fulfill this you know to, to help make this first world cup luckily you had enrique buero senior the the uruguayan diplomat um, you know to belgium yeah. who was really working behind the scenes to mm -hmm. uh, to make this not just a an america's cup because that's yeah. what it would have been yeah it, mm -hmm. it you know if enrique and subsequently jules rimet didn't push in a country that is so far away and so small. Enrique Buero was sent to Belgium to convince uh, Belgium at first. I think Belgium was the first country yes. that was uh, that subscribed, let's say. Jury Mayer said, yeah, if Belgium goes, we have to go too. And then yeah. uh, they had uh, two more others, so uh, Yugoslavia and uh, Romania. And then uh, they took off. Um, I think Romania was even, the players have been paid by their king. Uh, th those who had to to leave their job, uh, so the king paid their wages. Is what I've uh, been reading uh, the past years. Thank you so much, so much. All right, okay. take care. Have a nice day. <laughs> Bye. All right, you too. <laughs> Would Thank be you. Happy to participate. It was a pleasure to meet you. <laughs> Have a good day.